I'm very pleased to welcome uh, two very special guests in the Ritman Library today. First place, uh, Dr. Marco Pasi, Associate Professor at the University of Amsterdam. Um, here today in the library to uh, do the filming of a webinar on Arthur Edward Waite. But because he's always very dynamic and uh, traveling into many unexpected uh, and unexplored areas, at least that goes for the library. He brought today to the library uh, Professor Geronimo Pizarro, uh, who's uh, considered one of the most um, prominent experts in Fernando Pessoa. And uh, I'm pleased to have you both here in the library. And I would like to ask you some questions because you have made me very curious. I have to apologize because we don't collect literature in the first place in the library. I have to admit we don't have Pessoa in the library. <laughs> but it seems there is such interesting connections. So um, I have some questions for you. Maybe in the first place, uh, Geronimo, you can tell us something about Pessoa and what the connection uh, with this library would be, according to you. Well, thank you so much. If we think about uh, modernism and the relation with esotericism in Portugal, we have to think about Fernando Pessoa. Uh, he is the main, main reference. We have to think uh, Western esotericism in Portugal and maybe in the Iberian Peninsula at the time. So he was a poet, he was a writer, he was also in a way a philosopher. He moved through different areas all his life. He never tried to specialize only in one area. He was also a translator, a critic, a publisher, uh, many, many things. He lived in South Africa almost 10 years in the colony of Natal. So he went with uh, his mother to, to meet the stepfather that was the Portuguese consul in South Africa, in Natal. And uh, those 10 years in this English colony were very important because most of the writings he left in one or two famous trunks are in English. And uh, most of his esoteric writings uh, are in English. So that helps us a lot. He was reading in French, in English, some Portuguese uh, books on esotericism, but when we think about esotericism and so on, most of the things we have to transcribe are already in English. And you are referring to trunks? Are those some magic boxes? What kind of <laughs> yeah, well, he was uh, known for uh, writing and writing maybe three, four, five texts uh, a day, and he left uh, more, almost uh, uh, 30,000 papers, sheet of papers in the in those trunks. So when he died he had published some things, he had published uh, many poems, some uh, two, one or two book reviews, some interviews, uh, some of his translations, but uh, most, most of the things he wrote uh, between uh, 1888 and 1935 in those 47 years he lived, most, most, most things were published uh, by 1935. So we are working both with things that he published, but those are few, and with that vast majority of things that he left unpublished in his trunks. And in his trunks he left uh, all kind of uh, written uh, production, and uh, he wrote under many, many names, or pen names. So in one of the last books that was published in Portugal, uh, we consider that uh, Fernando Pessoa divided himself in 136 figures, and that he created uh, 135 different authors 
not just pen names or not just characters, almost all uh, authors uh, as himself. And uh, in those trunks, we are also reading what he left and what he attributed to many, many different uh, characters, fictitious characters created by himself. Oh, how very interesting. And, and actually, you know each other because you have been working together at the Netherlands Institute for Advanced Studies to uh, research the contents of these trunks and basically um, also uh, because of that um, the esoteric interests of Pessoa, uh, which we don't know so very much about. And, and could you tell uh, Marco something more about this uh, research, this fellowship that you did at uh, Benias? Benias. Yes, uh, well, Jeronimo and I, we know each other already for quite some time, uh, before uh, the NIAS, of course, we took place in uh, 2012. I have been working on uh, Pessoa's esotericism for quite a number of years. Uh, actually, it has been one of my earliest interests uh, in the field of esotericism. It goes back to 1992-1993. And um, <clears throat> it started because uh, Pessoa, at one point, was interested in the writings of another occultist, Alistair Crowley, whom he met also at one point uh, in Lisbon. And so, uh, I, at the time, I was doing research on Alistair Crowley, and I came across uh, Pessoa. Pessoa, uh, uh, already by the time, was considered as one of the major figures of 20th century literature, really international literature. And uh, I realized that there was a very strong esoteric element uh, in his works, uh, in his thought, and uh, already I had the idea at that time to, um, to go deeper, to, to, to do some research in this direction. Well, then uh, I did some research at the time, but uh, I was also sidetracked by other interests, uh, other projects, and then uh, well, I met uh, Jeronimo, I think it must be already uh, four years ago, uh, we, we had met in Lisbon because um, I was there for, for doing research and I knew that uh, Jeronimo was one of the most important specialists in, uh, uh, in Pessoa studies now. And so after we met, well, we had the idea perhaps to combine our expertise to put it together because he is a philologist and uh, uh, he has the ability to read all of the handwritten texts by mm. Pessoa. It's very difficult because Pessoa has a very peculiar handwriting. Sometimes it's very difficult to read, sometimes it's written with, in pencil. So it's also almost uh, uh, impossible to decipher. Yeah. Um, so from my, from my side, of course, I have the expertise in the history of uh, esotericism, in the history of esoteric ideas. So we thought that together we could work on a project uh, for the study of Pessoa's esotericism, which has been studied by other scholars before. But we think that there is so much more that can be done. There are texts that have never been published, that are still unknown. Uh, this is why we uh, decided to, well, to apply for a fellowship at the Netherlands Institute for Advanced Studies, which is in Wassenaar, close to The Hague. And uh, well, the application was successful, and so we spent the whole semester there, the, the first half of uh, 2012, working in what are perfect conditions for scholars, because uh, you have a very nice office space for yourself, you have the whole of the Royal Library at The Hague at your disposal, and all the other libraries in the Netherlands. You ask for a book the day after, they bring it to you in your office, so it's, it's really fantastic. And uh, since um, uh, the papers of Pessoa have been digitalized, it is also easy enough to work on the material, even if you're not physically in uh, the National Library uh, in Lisbon, where the actual paper documents are preserved. Uh, you can do checks and controls later, but mm -hmm. in principle, uh, you can do a large part of the work for this kind of research anywhere, uh, because you have the digital scans of the actual documents. You, you brought today this wonderfully designed publication of, of, of the private library of uh, Pessoa. 
and I'm I'm really impressed. There's some thousand uh, titles here. Could you tell us some some more about this uh, cataloging project? Well, this was a collective project we did in Lisbon uh, for free for many weeks, taking photographs of every every book and every page of this library bringing together different uh, projects of cataloging uh, this library, this uh, private library. And uh, it was very important because this is a library where you have a lot of notes. So Pessoa is not the kind of uh, writer that will just write and do nothing to the books. He will read the books and he will take many, many notes and sometimes uh, even uh, he will leave a poem in a, in a book, he will draw an horoscope, he will left uh, a maxim, an aphorism. So to read Pessoa, we also have to read his library. So we digitize or digitalize this library, also to, to show that it's a library that covers all possible areas of knowledge. And in terms of esotericism, it really, you can really find in Pessoa's library many, many interesting subjects. Not only astrology, he, he read a lot about astrology because he tried himself to be an astrologer. Uh, also, uh, there's a lot of uh, on hermetic literature, on alchemy, on Gnosticism. There are some books on Aleister Crowley because he met Aleister Crowley in 1930 when he went uh, to Portugal for some days, on Neopaganism, on Freemasonry, uh, on secret societies, and uh, uh, on reflections on the Catholic Church, and even on Oriental thought. So it's a very, very rich library of someone that all his life tried to be interested by different subjects and not to specialize himself. He will defend that uh, a specialization, any kind of a specialization, was a kind of uh, almost a stupid attitude towards the world, and he was uh, so open uh, to all kind of knowledge all of his life. And that is uh, present in his library. So I think that it's very important for us as researchers, not only to read what he left in his famous trunks, but to read his books and to read his books, reading his notes. When, when I opened uh, this, this uh, catalogue this morning, my eyes were drawn towards a beautiful quote of uh, Pessoa. And uh, he writes, uh, philosophy looks through the appearance of things, not into the heart of things, but into that which makes their appearance so into their inner nature and to me that that seems such a perfect uh, synthesis so to say of all the collecting areas here in this hermetic library and um, so I was wondering Marco uh, you, you must have studied especially uh, all, all the esoteric sources that you have found in his uh, collection. Could you say something more about it? Because mm -hmm. uh, the, 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 the second book that I saw, so to say, was Wade, Arthur Edward Wade, mm -hmm. uh, on the Brotherhood of the Rosy Cross. And mm -hmm. you are here today for the webinar on Wade. So there are so ma many connections. Can you tell something more about it? Well, uh First of all, it is, it is uh, difficult to summarize uh, Pessoa's esoteric views uh, for a number of reasons. Mm, the first one is that he was very eclectic. So he was reading a lot, a lot of different sources. Uh, he was interested in um, so occultism, contemporary occultism, uh, but also in more ancient sources. And there are... Um, Traditions, for instance, with which he was familiar and he was very interested in, that are really peculiar also to the history of Portugal. For instance, the tradition of Sebastianism or the tradition of the Fifth Empire. These are traditions that uh, have to do with a kind of prophetic millennialist tradition that has been particularly strong in Portugal. Um, so the combination of all these different sources make for uh, a kind of system that um, 
it's very difficult to describe and to uh, uh, and to synthesize. Uh, another important problem is the fact that uh, clearly Pessoa uh, goes through different uh, phases in his life. So there is a kind of evolution. The problem is that since he didn't publish really mm. these sources, sometimes it is difficult to reconstruct exactly the steps of this evolution because you cannot refer, for instance, to a printed or a published source where there is a date on it and then you can say, okay, this must belong to that period in his life. You have uh, a huge amount of loose papers, loose sheets, uh, sometimes typewritten, sometimes handwritten, and it is very difficult, uh, especially for the non-specialist, to determine exactly to which period in his life uh, a particular piece of paper belongs. Uh, so this is where, for instance, the expertise of Geronimo is fundamental, because he yeah. is quite familiar uh, with the ink, for instance, or the, the, the handwriting, the style of the handwriting, which has changed over the years, the particular kind of paper that he used in a particular period. Now, these are all philological aspects in this research that are extremely important because they allow us to determine exactly what are the main features of this evolution, of this development in his, uh, in his thought. Anyway, to, uh, to give uh, a kind of very broad idea, because of course we cannot enter into too many details, I would say that probably one of the aspects that are quite striking about, uh, about Pessoa's esotericism is the fact that he is a kind of dualist. <clears throat> and to some extent, maybe uh, uh, there could be an interesting analogy with Swedenborg, which is interesting because he doesn't refer to Swedenborg so much. I think there is one reference uh, in one place, but mm. he doesn't seem to be really a reader of, uh, of Swedenborg. Uh, so probably it's something that is very much mediated through uh, occultist literature and other sources. But uh, there is a kind of strong dualism uh, in the fact that he uh, posits a strong division between material reality and spiritual reality. Obviously, the spiritual reality is much more important. And uh, so the ability of the esotericist is to go through the material reality uh, with a particular vision, so to open the eyes to the existence of the spiritual reality, and through uh, forms of initiation, of spiritual advancement, uh, penetrate into the spiritual reality. I think this is also very close to uh, a form perhaps of Gnosticism. Yeah? He considered himself uh, a Gnostic uh, and he speculates a lot about Gnosticism. There is a, a whole series of writings about, uh, about Gnosticism. So I think that this is the kind of, uh, of uh, general, general structure of his thought. The difference f uh, from Swedenborg is that for Pessoa, you, you never seem to reach, uh, let's say, the other side. It's not that there is the material uh, reality and the spiritual reality, and, and they are like that, and they are in a kind of mutual relationship, as in uh, Swedenborg. With Pessoa, it seems like the spiritual reality itself always hides a further reality. Mm -hmm. So it's a kind of mise en abîme, in the sense that uh, you, you can go very far, but there is always something beyond that, and beyond and beyond. Mm. So it's a never-ending process to some extent, and you never seem to be able to reach the end. So um, this is something that uh, filters through uh, the esoteric texts, of course, but also in his poetry. So in his literary creations sometimes, uh, the esoteric visions that, uh, that he has uh, are very much present. Eh? So, uh, in this sense, perhaps we have uh, a case that is not too dissimilar to that of other uh, literary authors of the 20th century. Probably the most famous comparison would be with uh, William Butler Yeats. Uh, yes. uh, Pessoa, interestingly enough, was also uh, familiar with some of um, uh, the teachings and the structure of the Hermetic Order of the Golden Dawn. And this was through uh, the readings that he made of uh, partly of Aleister Crowley, but Aleister Crowley had his own uh, interpretation of, uh, of this, which was very peculiar and idiosyncratic, but also Arthur Edward Waite. 
Arthur Edward Waite is clearly uh, a very important source to, to Pessoa. Pessoa was also very interested in Freemasonry, Rosicrucianism, alchemy, and many of his uh, ideas and notions about these traditions are coming from Waite. It's because he's reading Waite. That's what I find so interesting, because we've been taking a, a look, we made a discovery tour through our library to see how many of the sources that are enlisted in his library can be found here. And it's quite amazing, I must say, because it's it's quite a broad, a broad survey of all the topics here. And uh, what w one of the first questions I had for, for, for instance, on uh, theosophy, uh, he's even translated Blavatsky and he's translated others in this mm -hmm. field. Um, his encounter with theosophy, Freemasonry, Rosicrucianism is through books, mm -hmm. isn't it? It's yes. not through encounters with people. It's, it's a very interesting aspect of Pessoa's personality. He was not a joiner. Uh, he was an explorer. He was a traveler. Yes. But for some reason, he didn't want to belong to a particular group, to a particular movement. So he was actually uh, very well acquainted with uh, the history of Freemasonry, uh, with the rituals of Freemasonry. And we know that he even wrote rituals, yeah. because he left some rituals. But we don't know what he was doing with these rituals. It's as if he was writing rituals for orders and groups that never existed, really. Uh, and it's an open <coughs> question. We don't know if he was a Freemason. Well, we, maybe we know, but it's a discussion that it's open in Portugal. We don't know if he was initiated. And uh, it's also an open discussion. And uh, the way he was affiliated or not to a secret society, uh, it always looks as if he was a secret, uh, obscure student of these subjects and not exactly uh, a member. There's no clear membership, I think, mm -hmm. but that's an open discussion. Well, I'm, I'm, I'm truly fascinated now because um, we, we have been going through uh, the material that we have found in the library, all the, all the books that we have found. There's, there's so many connections, and you have told me that there's so much material that's there ready to be researched but not yet published. But I was, I was privileged, I guess, and saw a glimpse of some wonderful material that we, uh, as, as, as the Ripon Library, would be delighted to, to see more of. For instance, there was a beautiful poem quoting the Fama Fraternitatis, and it is a poem on Christian Rosenkreutz, no tumoro na Christian Rosenkreutz, could you mm -hmm. yeah. enlighten us a bit? <laughs> well, uh, we, we did this work in the library looking for sources mentioned by Pessoa in his books uh, and the esoteric library. Many, many books in Pessoa's uh, private library are here in the Bibliotheca in Amsterdam. And uh, between those books we have, we find the uh, Fama Fraternitatis, we found uh, Ed Arthur Edward Wade, we find Whitman, Whitman, we find books like this, uh, this is Mead, well this is uh, Wade, Wade. Wade. there book, was uh, uh, about the Great Pyramid, the, the Great Pyramid, some books on Freemasonry, I was looking for this one, this was published I think in 31, and he's uh, so interested in Freemasonry in the five last, last years of uh, Man his Man life. Man Pirol, even he read. Exactly. Yes. So, uh, well, we did the research on all these books. Uh, it's an ongoing research. And in terms of Christian Rosenkreutz, we have at least uh, one very famous poem. Pessoa left uh, maybe 30, 40 poems that we can consider esoteric, uh, explicitly esoteric. Sometimes they are published together with Mensagen, uh, the book yes. that he published yes. in 34. And this is a very famous poem, Nutumulo uh, de Christian Rosencruz. I can read the Portuguese, the beginning, and Marco might read the, the English. 
Quando despertos deste sono, a vida, soubermos o que somos e o que foi esse mal, essa queda, esta descida, até ao corpo noite que a alma obstrui. This is the beginning of the poem. Oh my God, I didn't expect this. So I have to do the, the English translation. So I will try uh, to improvise a little bit. So when uh, we wake up from this dream, which is life, we will know what we are and what was this evil, this search, this descent uh, until the body which is the shadow that, the, that uh, um, closes up the soul, that encloses the soul. So uh, the message is very clear. The soul that descends into the body as if uh, a prison uh, and then the legend of becomes the free again, close. becomes free again when we die. And at that moment we realize that our mortal uh, material life was just a dream and that we wake up to the real life which begins only after we have been through this process yes, because this is the moment when the soul mm -hmm. uh, begins its ascent back to the original source well that's that's truly fascinating because uh, in the fama there's there's of course this beautiful fragments where the brothers of of the, the, the Brotherhood, the, the Rosicrucian Brotherhood, uh, discover the, the grave room or temple of Christian Rosenkreuz. And there are one of the ex axiomata uh, that uh, he, during his life, made the compendium of all knowledge, all wisdom, to a grave. Oh. Yes. And in fact, this uh, was very much uh, present uh, in the Golden Dawn and in the Rosicrucianism that uh, was so strong in England at the end of the 19th century. In fact, in the Golden Dawn, they tried to reconstruct the vault, uh, the tomb of Christian mm -hmm. Rosenkreuz. And some of the rituals of the Golden Dawn were based precisely on the description of the Fama Fraternitatis. And the idea was that in the tomb, the body, the uncorrupted body, uh, of Christian Rosenkreuz would be present yes. uh, and that there would be also the moment of uh, return uh, to life. Well, yeah. uh, 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 this, is, this is really fascinating and in a way you could say that this, this whole living heritage of Pessoa that has been found exactly. in, in a trunk mm -hmm. by accident maybe is now unveiled and we will yeah, learn a lot more about it. It's, it's, like, body. Exactly. it's <laughs> like an uncorrupted body of wisdom. It is. I think it was not accidental. I think that Pessoa constructed his life to live uh, for posterity an uncorrupted body. I think we are working on that uncorrupted body of wisdom of Fernando Pessoa. And uh, even if we go to history in 85, when he was, uh, when, when his body was translated, moved to a monastery in Lisbon, it was uncorrupted, and it was a problem, and they could not bury <laughs> Pessoa in 85 in Lisbon, because they thought it was going to be a corrupted body, and it was not. So, physically and metaphorically, I think Pessoa today, uh, his body, the body of his papers, his trunks, are part of that big, big, uh, mythical, uncorrupted body. Well, I'm, I, I can only be grateful that you found our library and you acquainted us with this uncorrupted body of wisdom. And I hope I, I will learn a lot more of what is to come as, as a result of your collaboration, the, 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 the publication that you're preparing now. And I can only hope that many, many people come to the library uh, for such uh, discovery tours as, as yours. Because my experience in the library is that we are hermetically open. We open our doors to visitors in general and specialists, of course. And many, many times we learn a lot ourselves. So. Thank you very much.